the area that I work in is mainly livestock parasites and parasitic disease is, is, is one of the major health costs for most of the livestock industries. In, in the cattle industries we have ticks, buffalo flies up there as major parasites, then internal parasites and also parasites vectored by arthropods, for example tick fever and increasingly tyleria further south. Now currently um, most of our, our interventions for paras parasite control are animal-centred. And there's good reason for that. There's good practical reasons, there's good economic reasons, and there's certainly efficiency. So the, most of the controls sort of fall into these groups. We have pesticide application, and pesticides are by far still the mainstream um, method of control. And we have all of these, these myriad... Uh, methods, oh there we go, Method, methods of application. We have pesticide ear tags, drenches and injections, dips. And this one here, which I had to put up there, it's not actually one of ours. It's a thing which has just been registered for use in the States. And it's basically paintballs with pesticide. So basically you shoot the cattle and, and the pesticide spreads out. And you can just imagine the sort of fun some producer's kid's going to have if this ever gets, um, gets uh, uh, registered in Australia. I doubt that it will for various reasons. Um, we also look at resistant genotypes, you know, um, for example, uh, for tick resistance and buffalo fly resistance. Vaccines are a major method of control, more for diseases than the, than the parasites per se, usually. Uh, and cultural controls, and there's a whole lot of these sorts of things. Grazing management for internal parasites and for ticks. Uh, things like crutching and shearing for fly strike control. But largely animal based. Now, I just want to go back. As I said, parasites are currently pretty much the, the major group of, of health problems in most of the livestock systems. However, um, a lot of those tend to be tropical. And there's now increasing evidence um, that these are starting to increase their range further southward. So, for example, just a couple to pick out. Homonchus. Homonchus placei is basically a tropical worm parasite, quite pathogenic, in northern Australia. That's recently turned up and is cycling, re-establishing in, in, in southwest, western Australia. Tyleria was here as a pretty much a fairly benign parasite. It's now turned out to be more pathogenic in some of the range where it was before, and it's also emerged down in Victoria, vectored by, by Haemophysalis ticks. Uh, Culicoides and, and, and arbovirus vectors. We have good evidence for them um, potentially moving southward in Australia under climate change, but we've already had one particularly interesting um, occurrence of this in Europe, where, where Always regularly, Culicoides used to, used to invade from North Africa, but didn't go very far, far north. And, and more re recently, it's actually gone far enough north that it's actually, and these are carrying blue tongue, which is quite a pathogenic, you know, it's a nasty disease of sheep, and one that we certainly don't, we don't want to get uh, as a disease of sheep in Australia. But, it, but it, th these vectors have gone far, far enough north that they've encountered another vector complex and, and, and uh, Culicoides has actually got into another vector complex which has made it more, more, uh, more of a problem actually in Europe going forward. Amiasis, fly strike, um, we've got evidence of, of a number of, of changes of, 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 um, of range of that in, in Europe in a number of places and there's concerns about what will happen with sheep blow fly strike in Australia. Um, Cattle ticks in, in the US, there's an there's a, um, exclusion zone between Texas and Mexico, increasing breaches further north, and, and modelling suggesting that's going to become a really big problem. And the same thing in Australia, we have the tick, tick line at the moment, but as, as it becomes more favourable for ticks south of the, the line, presumably the, 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 uh, the, the challenge is going to be, become more, more serious. And buffalo flies are, is certainly going southward, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Now. <laughs> As I said, we've always thought about, we think mainly with, with animal uh, controls on, on, an, on an animal basis. Most of our targets are that way. But, but we have a number of area-wide approaches as well, as well. And very often these are a great way of doing things because you know, in the best scenario, you prevent the parasite from ever being there in the first place or you, you eradicate it and control it you know, over a whole area. So, for example, we have quarantine barriers with, for example, cattle tick, as I said. So, so no, no, um, no problems with cattle tick south of the tick line. 
um, we have large-scale area-wide area, area -wide spraying campaigns. Now, this happens particularly with mosquitoes, but also in Africa with tsetse. And for all the reasons you'll understand, people don't like having la uh, planes fly over the top of them spraying insecticides, although it's happening again currently with Zika virus outbreaks in some areas. Um, we, we, we look at also an area we look at targeting the off, off host stages, for example, flukes and sometimes mosquitoes in water management stage um, um, situations, tetsi, area wide integrated control. And we look at area wide IPM, that's it's becoming a bit of a jargon term in terms of controlling invasive parasites. And, and usually with area wide IPM, we have a core technology which is largely um, currently insecticides in most, in most um, cases. However, that's, these are not the ones that I want to talk about today. Those ones are still largely targeted at the animals, the biocontrol ones not, not always, but, um, but here in, in this talk I want to talk mainly about the potential for directly targeting the parasite populations on an area-wide basis. Now I'm just going to flip through these quickly and then I'm going to come back to a couple of advantages. Now the one you'll know mainly is the sterile insect technique, which has been, you know, it's, it's used for eradication of a whole lot of pests. And I'll come back to the screwworm fly one in a minute, but it's used in Australia for fruit fly control, for example, on a, on a, on a, um, on a local basis. Um, what this, uh, I just, just to go to the next point, I just need to go a bit further than I meant to, but, but basically, most flies mate only once, and so that the principle here is that you just release a whole lot of sterilised flies, so that the, that the chance of a wild-type female mating with, a, with a, a, a fertile male is very, very low. And so if she doesn't mate that first time, she's effectively sterile. Now the reason I, I just wanted to go a bit further there than I meant to, is that the one time that we've thought about using something similar in Australia with a livestock pest is against sheep blowfly. And for reasons I'll go into in a minute, um, doing that on an area-wide basis in Australia is, is really, really difficult. So back in the 70s, um, we, we, we looked at sort of tweaking that a little bit using these translocation strain um, strains of sheep blowfly, which were mainly produced by mutagenesis and, and, and a few other tweaks. And, and so I'll just talk, so a couple of the ones that we used were sex limited translocations where, where the, um, the, the trait was carried into the female, uh, it was active in the female population but carried by the males not expressed there. So the males basically spread genetic death or the, the translocation strains, basically these work by, by re-gluing re the, the, the different arms of the, 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 um, uh, the chromosomes so that when the translocation strain mates with the wild type, they're basically sterile, but they, in themselves, if they mate with, uh, amongst themselves, they're 25% sterile. So if you get your numbers right, and you still need big numbers, you can effectively replace a population in principle. Okay, so I'm not gonna say any more about that one. But what's more interesting is where we're going in the future. Now there's, there's a number of technologies out there, and I'm gonna talk about these in a bit more detail in a minute. Riddle, which is um, a, a release of insects carrying a dominant lethal, and this is, a, this is a, a technique out of Oxford University, currently being tested in Malaysia uh, by the, the spin-off company called Oxitec, Malaysia and, and in, um, uh, in Brazil as a mosquito uh, control. Um, uh, HEGs, homing endonucleus genes, I'm not going to go through these because it will take me a while, but you might want to read about that one, that one's pretty interesting. Uh, there's a whole lot of disease refractive vectors. Now, it, lo lots of people have actually engineered, for example, mosquitoes that, that are not competent uh, hosts for, for malaria or for, for other parasites. Um, so they're out there, uh, but there's a difficulty with those. And, and lethal or conditional lethal genes. Um, now, now, the big difficulty there is actually getting them into the population, and we'll come back to that in a minute. And another one is Wolbachia, which is an in intracellular bacteria, which I'm going to talk about in a lot more detail in a minute, and you, you may be familiar with because it's the, it's the cornerstone technology for the eliminate dengue um, uh, um, uh, mosquito uh, uh, control program in northern Australia and in a number of overseas countries now. And I'll talk about that in a bit more in a minute as well. So just, just to give you an idea of how these things work, to give you a feel of what we're talking about. 
So the, insect, the sterile insect technique, uh, and just to show you how successful these can be, the sterile insect technique was used to eradicate screwworm fly, which is like a sheep blowfly thing, a myosis fly, from North America. Um, if, you, if you look at this map here, this shows where um, screwworm used to be endemic and, and where it has been eradicated from. So, so completely out of the States, through Mexico, right down through Central America, and now bordering Colombia. So that pest is totally gone using sterile mail. So, so basically a whole lot of sterile insects reared, usually by irradiation, bred up and dumped out of planes um, to mate with wild type flies. Done again and again to, 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 until the chance, until, the, until it gets to the stage where the chance of a fertile female mating with a fertile male is, is, is nil. And by doing that, we basically eradicated, or not basically, have eradicated screwworm. And you can see that the cost benefit of this sort of approach, how good it can be. So, so the direct producer um, benefit per annum in the States is estimated at 896 million. In, um, in Mexico, 328 million. And in Central America, 87 million. And the return per year is less, um, is, is greater than the total cost of this project over, over the 50 years since it was started. So hugely, huge economic benefits. Um, it's also been used elsewhere, for example in Libya, to eradicate a screwworm incursion there. Or was, uh, screwworm not a, wasn't previously present in Libya. It was used to outbreak, a, uh, used to eradicate there. It's currently being tested in Uruguay. Um, it's part, this technique is part of the Australian Old World Screwworm um, uh, Preparedness Program, although we haven't got a colony anymore and, and if we, you know, it would take us ages to, 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 uh, to uh, get into that. It's been used to eradicate tetsi, tetsi fly in Zanzibar. It's been used for fruit flies and for some mosquitoes. So it's, it's been ver a very, 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 sec sec um, very, very successful technique. I just wanted to talk about, uh, just quickly, just look at a couple of the other techniques. Now, as I said, the riddle technique is currently, uh, this is one that is actually currently being released in the field now. You can see that the males carry and deliver transgenes to the, to the, which are expressed in the females. And in the, in the particular instance I'm showing up here, the females have a, a, a um, uh, it, it confers a, a um, a fault in the flight muscle so the flies can't fly and therefore they've functionally lost their field effectiveness. There's a couple of other, other traits that are being looked at as well. Um, so, so, the, yeah, and so the males aren't affected, they, they stay there and they continue to spread the, the, um, uh, translica or the um, um, fault uh, and you know, so, so, so just, they last a little bit longer than you would with a sterile male approach. Um, as I said, we, there's been a lot of work on disease refractive effectors and, and one of the techniques only is, is basically using RNAi to produce mosquitoes which, um, which do not transmit the virus, okay, and, um, um, and then releasing them into the field so that the males once again are carrying this, uh, this fault. As I said, there's a whole lot of other things we've looked at, uh, for example, conditional lethals and reinsta reinstating insect um, susceptibility, insecticide susceptibility. So, re so basically replacing the population with, with insecticide susceptible uh, um, m um, insects. But the issue here, and we've always said this, has always been it's really nice to engineer all of these sorts of, of, of insects. But how do you get them into the population? I mean, you're putting something out there which has is, is got to be, by definition, it's got to be unfavourable or maybe not in the vector state, but you've got to actually get them into the population. And that has been a big problem. But we now have the CRISPR technology. Now, it's not the area I deal in, but um, there'll be a lot of people here who do know about it. And I've heard a colleague in, at Melbourne Uni, uh, Phil Batterham, suggest that the guys who developed the CRISPR, CRISPR technology will pr probably at some stage get a Nobel Prize for it. It's that, it's that important a technology. And, and I think if you look at it in this insect um, context, you'll see why it is, it is potentially such a good technology. So one way, one thing that we ca can use to get traits into 
uh, population are gene drives. And there's some natural gene drives out there that, that, that actually drive through a population. There's a particular one called the P element, which is now pretty much through all fruit fly um, uh, populations. But yeah, that's nice, but what can you do with it? Well, not much until we got CRISPR, which allows us to really sensitively um, modify these sorts of gene drives and potentially put genes in there um, attached or built into the drive and have them push through the population. So just going back to the, the gene drives, what they, they do is they favourably transmit the, the um, one particular trait through a population and, that, and eventually they'll, they'll, they'll reach fixation at some level. So, so rather than having two chromosomes uh, segregating 50-50, the one with the drive will, will, will spread more quickly. Okay. So, so what we have now is the CRISPR technology plus gene drives. And this means that we can actually drive some of those traits that we're talking about through a population. And this has already been done in the laboratory. There's a couple of mosquito studies now in the lab where they've actually driven, um, for example, the inability to act as a vector into the population. Now, if you think about it, in this sense, this is an incredibly powerful technology, but it's also potentially, and you know, it's a very new technology, it's also potentially a bit of a scary technology because in principle, you could drive any sort of gene that you want to through any, any sort of a wild population. And, and what it will do in an ecological sense, we have yet to know. So, so people are, even though this is really, really powerful, people are progressing very, very carefully. They're, they're particularly worried, uh, not worried, but aware of the sociological issues and the ecological issues of this. And this, this is, there's going to be a lot of work done in that space before any of these get released. But it is, an ex and you can just think of the, the possibilities of what we can now do. You know, eradicate malaria? Possibly, you know, long term, using this technology if we get them out there. Okay, now, now I'm going to move on to Warbarkia. And the reason for part of that was, was to, what I've talked about so far is twofold. One, to talk about the power of area-wide controls. And two, just to give a bit of a... Uh, a idea of how important it is to be able to drive these things into a population. Well, another way of possibly doing it is using an intracellular bacteria called Wolbachia, which I'm, you know, if you're interested in insects or dengue at all, you'll certainly have heard of. So, so Wolbachia is a maternally transmitted intracellular bacteria. Okay? So it only goes mother to daughter or mother to, to egg, mother to offspring. It's related to um, Rickettsia anaplasma and Ehrlichia, which are all arthropod transmitted pathogens. And it's thought of as a reproductive parasite. Now, as a reproductive parasite, it basically has... Um, um, the first thing that nearly all of these strains do is they have an effect of cytoplasmic incompatibility. Now, what that means is... And, and the, the whole reproductive parasite comment is that, that it, it, it has a way of driving itself into a population. Okay, so, so, so what it means is that if a male with Wolbachia mates with a female without Wolbachia, um, the results of that mating will be sterile. The eggs won't work. And, and you can, whereas if either a wild-type female or a Wolbachia-infected female mates with a Wolbachia-infected female, the, the results of that mating will be fertile. Now, if you, if you go back and do all the population dynamics and you get all the ratios right, what that means is, is eventually um, the, the, the Wolbachia will drive itself through a population. And there's numbers of examples of that happening, either intentionally or not intentionally. I'll come to that, back to those later. The other things that it does, still in this space, um, in, it, what, what, what Wolbachia does depends very much on, on the context that it's in. But some of the other things that it does is it, it will stimulate parthenogenesis, and usually you get female offspring. Now, if you think of it, once again, favouring, you know, classic parasite, favouring the Wolbachia because all of the females will have the Wolbachia and they'll spread it through the population. Feminisation of genetic males, so if the males have the Wolbachia, um, uh, they become females and then they can spread the Wolbachia through the thing. And male killing of deaths during embryonic development. So that gives an advantage to the females, once again, spreading it through the population. But the one that I'm going to think of, talk about mainly 
so far as the cytoplasmic incompatibility. Okay, there's a number of other things that Wolbachia does which can also be important. It has various fitness effects. Now, it has effects on lifespan, and this is a particular one, um, popcorn, popcorn Wolbachia, which reduces the, 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 the lifespan of, of the insect. And in, in the dengue context, this was the one that they were going to go with initially, because dengue is only transmitted by old mosquitoes. It takes a while for, for the virus to, to develop in the mosquito and become, get to a stage where it is then going to be transmitted. Transmitted. So the idea here was that by spreading Wolbachia through a population, you would reduce the lifespan of, of, of the females so they couldn't transmit Wolbachia. Now that's not the one they've gone with, I'll come to that in a minute. It's just a bit more difficult to get through a population because it's also spreading a, a fitness deficit. But it's one that I might want to talk about in a minute. So that's, that's one. Um, but there's also some other things, you know, like locomotor activity, which reduce fitness in the field. And there's a thing uh, that in, it can sometimes interrupt blood feeding. And there's this trait with infected mosquitoes called affectionately bendy proboscis. So presumably they try to punch and it sort of bends around. Um, but just, just think about the, the popcorn one at the moment. But there's a number of fitness effects. That's, that's the important bit. Um, the other thing, and this is the one that's being used in the, dengue, the Eliminate Dengue program at the moment, um, no one knew about this initially, but, but um, well, Bark here inhibits, it directly has an effect inhibiting transmission of secondary pathogens. Not quite sure how it does it, might just be a competition thing, but if you're infected with Wolbachia, you become a much less efficient vector of things like, like dengue in the first place, but also some of the nasty filarial nematodes like Onchocerca, uh, that's black fly, not mosquitoes, but Wuchereri, you know, elephantiasis, also inhibit, it also compromises their ability to transmit those. And this is the one that's been, uh, the, the W. Merle, which, which actually does this, is the one that's been released in the Townsville area for, for dengue control. The other thing, this is not really relevant, but it's just interesting in the parasitology um, uh, context, is the other group of organisms which have Wolbachia or can have Wolbachia are filarial nematodes. Now, unsurprisingly, these are the insect vectored nematodes. Things like Onchocerca, we'll come to in a minute, river blindness, like dog heartworm. And what we're finding is that, A, it can be very important to the survival of these nematodes. So, so basically, it's, 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 it's a required um, symbiont of Onchocerca. If you take the Wolbachia away, away, the worms die. And so, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, and also, in dog heartworm, it's involved in, in the pathology of dog heartworm. Uh, and that's also uh, leading to some important effects. And, and by the pathology, any of you who have dogs know that you have to medicate um, on, you know, preventatively to stop them actually getting bitten. And the main reason for that is because you can't do much about it once they get the worms there. The reason you can't do much about it is because if you kill the adult worms in the heart, you'll get a whole on anaphylactic um, um, chain of events um, which, which will in all likelihood, or, or it's very likely, will actually kill the, the dog. Now, it turns out that a lot of that, that immune reaction is actually to the Wolbachia, not the worms per se. And as I said, this is leading, learning to, um, leading, leading to um, treatment approaches. So I just wanted to give you a couple of examples of where, where, of where Wolbachia has, of what Wolbachia has done in the field. And probably the most, the most profound one is this Eliminate Dengue program in Townsville. This year, um, eight, as I said, it's driven itself through the population. 80% of, of the mosquitoes of the Aedes aegypti in the release areas now carry um, uh, Wolbachia. And, and it's hard to prove a negative, but for the first time for 15 years... So, so the, the rationale here is if somebody comes back from overseas with dengue, because dengue is not, not endemic in Australia, if they get bitten by a mosquito, the, the mosquito could then spread it through the population. So the, the rationale is that if the, if, if the mosquito is carrying dengue, even if it bites the infected um, person, it's not going to be able to transmit the dengue further. And so... You know, presumably some people have come back from overseas with dengue, but this year, for the first time for 15 years, there have been no cases of dengue in the towns in the, within the release area. So, so the evidence is, uh, preliminary as it might be, that it, is, it, it might be working. Um, one of the early, early uses 
of, of Wolbachia, and people didn't, I don't think, knew it was Wolbachia exactly at this stage, they just knew it as cytoplasmic incompatibility, was, was back in 67 when, um, when Laven used um, cytoplasmic or, uh, incompatible strains to eradicate um, Culex, which carries filariasis, in that case, Wuchereria, um, from, from localised areas. So once again, showing, showing the, the potential for it to work. French Polynesia, another mosquito. There's, there's um, some, some promising results out of there. Show, once again, a, a, a filariasis um, uh, uh, vector. Um, and just, just to give you an idea of how well this, this Wolbachia can spread, in Drosophila now, it's pretty much right through California. And at one stage, Dros um, Wolbachia was spreading in the population at 100 kilometres uh, per year. So, so it can also happen really quite quickly. As I, I mentioned about Onchocerca and river blindness, you know, basically what happens here is you get, you get a, um, uh, infected with a nematode and, and if, 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 if some stages the nematodes actually get into the eyeballs, you can get a, once again an immune reaction which can cause blindness. And if anyone's taken a parasitology course, you'll probably be aware of um, this, you've probably seen this slide before. And, and in certain areas of Africa, um, by 30 pretty much everyone was blind and this shows young kids who aren't yet blind, taking the adults to, to, to or somewhere, probably to water or to, or to food. Now, using ivermectin and, and increasingly well, bar, um, and, uh, doxycycline, working actively against the um, Wolbachia symbiont, um, have, there, there's really good treatment outcomes and, and you don't need to, with, with ivermectin you have to treat every six months with using doxycycline to wipe out the um, the uh, uh, Wolbachia, you can um, increase the, the period of time you treat uh, much longer. And, and for the dog heartworm, same sort of use using doxycycline or sometimes tetracycline. But the, the, the strategy here is to wipe out the Wolbachia in the adult worms before you kill the worms. And that there's, this is it's experimental at this stage, but there, it is showing some, some uh, benefit where you just don't get those um, anaphylactic effects. Okay, so, so now I'm going to now I'm going to I'm going to flip very quickly um, through an area. We're actually going to go to buffalo flies. So now, for those of you who don't know buffalo flies, they're obligate parasites of, of, of cattle. They sit on the on the backs of cattle and basically bite them. Um, they only leave to, to lay their eggs in manure. Um, they have nasty mouth parts. They're pool feeders, so they basically slash and suck. They they actually cut and then lap the the blood out of the um, out of the, the leaking capillaries. Now, this is, is, is quite different to mosquitoes. We have nice fine um, stylets and, and so they're really irritating. And if you've ever been bitten by one, they hurt. And so if you've got a thousand, thousand of these sitting on, you, on your back, d biting 20 to 40 times, um, it's really irritating for the cattle. Um, uh, they also have, um, uh, sorry, Got these out the wrong way. The other thing they do is they vector a filarial nematode, and that combined with the effects of the feeding of, of the nematodes, uh, effects of the feeding of the flies, cause this basically allergic reaction down here. Uh, which, and, and the flies preferentially feed from there, which is incredibly um, painful for the cattle. And, and it also could um, serve as a screwworm focus where we were ever to get screwworm introduced. Um, so horn fly, uh, bu buffalo flies, I'm going to flip, I'm running a bit short. Well, uh, um, uh, buffalo flies are very closely related to horn flies, uh, which is a major pest in North America. Uh, in fact, they, for many years they were considered to be sub subspecies and some people would argue that they still are. They're similar in, habit, uh, in habitat and they're both invasive. And um, you can see that um, just looking at the history of, um, of horn flies. They were introduced to the States in 1885. They basically got to, um, to northern Brazil in 1956, spread right down through, through Central America, um, south of the Amazon in 1980, and between 1980 <coughs> and 1993, they've spread right through South America pretty much. Now, I said they're very close. There is a couple of, of big differences, and th these are important. Firstly, Buffalo fly, uh, horn fly has an overwintering capacity. They overwinter as pupae uh, through the winter and then when the, the temperature's warm, they, they, they emerge and start the new population. 
Buffalo fly currently doesn't have that um, um, ability. They overwinter as low populations of adults in small folk. We'll come to that in a minute. Buffalo fly lesions are much more severe. You don't see those lesions in horn flies in the States, the ones that I showed you. Um, horn fly causes teat lesions in dairy cattle, but not buffalo fly, it seems, in Australia. But importantly, and I'll come to this in a minute, well, um, horn fly are, po uh, are positive for Wolbachia. Wolbachia, Wolbachia is endemic in buffalo fly, and I'll put up some stuff we've done here, but not, as it turns out, uh, is endemic in horn fly, but not as it turns out in buffalo fly. Um, I just wanted to put this, this map up because it shows the area invaded by horn flies and the area invaded with buffalo flies. And I just talked about that. The yellow is buffalo flies. The interesting bit is this bit here. Now, why hasn't, you know, horn flies showed its ability to go through the tropics very, very well. Why hasn't a horn fly also spread through Southeast Asia? Now, it could just be a species thing if they are. We, we don't know if they're reproductively isolated, and, and for reasons I'm not going to go into, it's very hard to show that. Um, so it could just be as an interspecific sterility, or could it perhaps, perhaps be Wolbachia? But for whatever reason, this is interesting, because, because there's something going on there at that interface. Um, so buffalo flies, also invasive. We'll just skip, flip through these a bit. So this is an old slide. Um, that's an important bit. So, so introduced in 1838 from, North, uh, from, from Asia, um, got to the Queensland border in 1928, but it took them till 1941 to get across into this wetter area over here. And this, this spread bit here was, was associated with a, with, a, with a period of wet winters. From there on, it's basically spread right down and met, got to Bundaberg along creek lines across, um, across Cape York and got to Bundaberg in 1946 and there it sat for about 30 years. It didn't go any further south um, until um, 1977 when, when it, when it uh, started moving again and going south again. Now that was, could have been associated with a number of mild winters which happened during that period. We also changed our cattle tick treatment regime where we used amitraz, which is not an insecticide, and that might have had an effect as well. And there, there was also some changes in the regulatory program. But for whatever reason, it sat there for quite a while. Since then, we've had 82 and, and 2001, in that really wet winter, it was down as far as Narromine, Maitland in, in, Victoria, in, in, in um, New South Wales, and as far west as Burke, uh, Dubbo. So, so it really made a big jump. And, and the, the yellow area shows where it has periodic incursions. When we, during the winter, it, it sort of spreads out to that period, uh, to that area at times. In, in 2011, it also turned up in Alice Springs. Um, so, you know, there's a suggestion that it's actually moving quite quickly again. This is a bit of a climax modelling um, done um, uh, by, by Rob Dobson mainly, um, using the, a lot of work that Bob Suthurst, who many of you will have known, who worked in this area some time ago. This, this shows the um, predicted current uh, uh, spread of buffalo flies. This shows the predicted spread under climate change. And also note, the size of these um, d defines the, the relative favourability. So we could, we could also expect increasing impacts um, of buffalo flies in, in southeast Queensland, as well as an increase. Now, the other thing that I'll point I'd make here is that buff horn fly, buffalo fly doesn't currently have an overwintering capacity. But as I said, the g it's really close genetically. So, so one's got to think that the genes are lurking there somewhere. And, and when that actually gets, gets in an area where it's not also compromised by dry, um, that there's going to be a big selection pressure for, uh, for, over, for an overwintering capacity. And if that happens, uh, then you can see the whole of southern Australia, you know, in the wetter areas, in, invaded with, um, with buffalo fly. Okay, so look, I'm, I'm just running a bit short. I'm going to, this, this is basically just, just a, a talk about why area-wide controls um, might be really, really valuable. You know, we can reduce the impact. Um, producers might have no impact. You know, if the, the parasite's not there, they don't have to have to spend all this money controlling it, and they don't have to um, use all that labour up. And also, reduced chemical use is, is incredibly important in beef markets these days. Just just the ability to access organic markets, high value organic markets. 
um, and also just the overall sustainability of the beef industry and the perception of the beef industry. Um, I just want, the point basically here is, is to make a difference between what's actually happening with invasive species and what the situation is with endemic species. species. Now, as I said before, sheep blowfly was targeted using, people wanted to use a sterile male like approach and, 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 and there was uh, the, the translocation chromosome methodology was investigated. Now you can see this, I, I couldn't find a good distribution map, but, but the spots are all the places where Lucilia caprida has turned up. Now you can see that, that you're trying to use something like sterile male in these areas would be very, very difficult. Local eradication maybe, but, but just because of the, the huge areas involved. Um, now compare that to what happened with New World screwworm, the sterile male technique that I talked about. There was a couple of things there that were very important. In the States, screwworm was only endemic, it only occurred in the winter in Florida, down in that tip part of Florida. And it's it a very strong flying species, so every summer it would reinvade from, from Mexico and Central America. Really important thing, so it wasn't there, it only, only came in over summer. Um, and, and so, base, and, and then you had that, that, the whole isthmus down there of Central America. So basically the geography and the biology made sterile male possible because we could actually target those areas when there weren't many flies there and stop it getting in there. Compare that to what I just showed you with sheep blowfly. Very, very difficult. Now if we think about buffalo flies, you know, and, and maybe some other invasive pests as well, maybe we're in a situation where we can actually use these techniques. So if, you, if, if we look at this area down here where, where buffalo fly is expanding, you know, very narrow area, it's not that big. And the other point about this is the overwintering foci of buffalo flies, as I said, they overwinter as adults, and it's in very um, limited areas. Okay, so it's, it's happening further south now. It didn't used to happen at Pinjaro Hills, it does happen at Pinjaro Hills now. Um, and so not only have we got that, that narrow area down there, but we've got the ability to map those areas where, or to talk to producers about where low numbers of flies persist and perhaps target just in those areas. And even, that doesn't only actually occur down here either, but up here we've got a similar sort of thing happening where, where you've got um, buffalo flies um, persisting through winter in quite limited foci, sometimes because of cold, sometimes because of dry. So once again, area-wide approaches, potentially a possibility. And then when we add to it this function of Wabaki that we talked about, it has the ability to drive itself through a population, things are starting to look like we might actually be able to do something in this space. Um, so how could we use Wilbarki? This is, this is basically just, just what we might be able to do if we can produce the, the insects. Well, we could use cytoplasmic incompatibility in terms of, a, of basically a sterile male approach to eradicate in foci. And that's what was done in, that, in Myanmar way back in those years ago. We could perhaps stick some fitness effects in there. So you know, even something that reduces lifespan, you know, if you do insect modelling and you look at what you know, reducing a parameter like that does, sometimes you can collapse populations just by reducing the, their fitness level. You know, and particularly when they're, they're already struggling because of you know, some other sort of stress. Um, we could also use pathogen blocking. As I said, those, those lesions are a source of much concern. We're, we're not completely sure of how important the nematodes are, but perhaps we could block, if we block spread of the nematodes, we can, we can have it go a long way to reducing the effects of the lesions, which are a significant welfare, welfare issue and a marketing issue, because live export cattle, they won't take them with those lesions. As I said, we could use it at the edge of the range to, you know, is basically um, a, to eradicate the advancing foci of, of, um, 
uh, of buffalo fly. You know, if buffalo fly gets, to a, gets down in the dairy areas and all the southern beef areas, um, that's going to be a huge cost. I didn't, I didn't underline the cost in, in South America and the States now, but it's, it's something like, like $900 million per annum in the States, where it's through the whole, whole area, and something like two point, I think it's $2.4 billion estimated in Brazil. So, so there's, there's potentially some big numbers here. And, and the other, I talked about you know, basically rele uh, releasing to collapse overwintering populations by putting a, you know, some sort of a fitness deficit in there. But perhaps we could actually also drive other genes into the population. And, and this is being looked at in a number of ways. We, could, we, we don't really want to engineer things because that makes release much more difficult. But you know, if we could attach, uh, have a strain which had fitness deficits or insecticide susceptibility, and that's the strain that has the wool bark here that we let go, um, we could perhaps drive these sorts of things in there. Or if, if overwintering develops, inability to overwinter. You know, that, that would be a, a great conditional lethal if we can drive it into the population. Um, so where are we up to in this? Now, now we're going to go just a little bit into the, some general biology stuff. Now, this is this is um, just just good in, in entomology, really. Um, one of the things which it was basically a game breaker to look at Wolbachia or to go forward with this stuff was having a buffalo fly colony. Now, we've never had a buffalo fly colony, and by colony, I mean a laboratory colony in Queensland before. There was one for a while in New South Wales, but we, we tried using that technique and we couldn't get that to work. Um, I'm not sure that, that one wasn't, didn't, wasn't kept for a long time. Now, the reason we need this is just, just think about the, the logistics of doing these studies of, of basically transfecting buffalo flies with, with Wolbachia and then having to do all the intercrossing studies if we had to do it on little cages on the backs of cattle. I mean, you know, it's, it's a disaster waiting for happen. You're just not ever going to be able to do that. You're not ever going to be able to maintain the strains. Um, you know, cattle in rooms, w all sorts of welfare implications that the animal ethics people hate um, and incredibly expensive. So we, we had to have a buffalo fly colony. Um, so, so we tried over a number of times. We tried everything. And this, this actually took us two years. We, we, we tried, we, we had something, I mean, it wasn't continual because we, we only could only bring them in when we had populations in the field. So it was during the summer. But we made something like 40 introductions. And we could get, sometimes get them to generation three, but never any further than that. Um, we, we looked, they were laying eggs. There was, um, there was um, eggs in the ovaries. Um, the females from the first generation laid perfectly, so, and the larvae grew through to the second generation, so it wasn't that, that part. But it was something to do with the eggs in the later areas. Um, so, we, we, so we looked at the males to see whether there was some sort of mating stuff happening. And I was, this is where I, was, I said, Bronwyn, that I had a slide specially for you because we had to visualise buffalo fly. They're not very big flies. Had to visualise buffalo fly spermatozoa. We had a bit of trouble trying to actually find them so that we could actually look at them in the testes of the flies and, and look at them in the spermatheca. Now, I mentioned to you before that flies only mate once, and that's because when they mate, this is the, the spermatheca in the females, they store the, the, the sperm in the spermatheci and they're used for, for um, fertilising subsequent um, um, batches of eggs. And the, the video I had for Bronwyn, because we never ever did show it, was the, um, there's actually, you can actually, there's, there's fine lines in the spermathecal ducts there, but that's the, that's the sperm in there. So, so basically, obviously, the problem was they weren't mating. Um, now, I'm going to flop around a bit here. Now, one of the reasons we thought they weren't mating was that they're incredibly attracted to light. And when we have them in the cages in the labs, they just hang off the roof of the cage all the time. We couldn't get them to respond to any sorts of cues. They wouldn't go down to manure. They wouldn't go down to cattle odours. They wouldn't, wouldn't do anything. And some of the, the more athletic amongst the audience might disagree with this, but we thought they were probably going to have some real difficulty in mating hanging upside down from the... From the, from the roof of the cages. So I had a summer student, and we looked at using different light sources to see whether we could, we could, we could illuminate the cages without attracting the flies. And, and um, Paul, uh, the, 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 the woman was Paula Gonzalez 
uh, Rivas. And we looked at all sorts of, of wavelengths, and pretty much all the time the flies were still up there. However, we did notice when we tried this, this, this um, reptile nightlight colour that we got this funny um, behaviour in the flies. They started just milling, just walking around, which we didn't see with any of the wavelengths. Okay, so just hold it there for a minute. So, so we, on the other, while this was happening, we were also thinking about the whole mating thing. We, um, and we sort of talked, you know, have you ever seen the things mate? No. Um, was there anything in the literature about buffalo flies mating? Well, no. No one had done any stuff. Was there anything about horn flies? Well, no. There was a little bit of Japanese stuff that perhaps suggested that they were there. So, so we said we should have a look. So I went out to Pinjara Hills, and, and it's, a very, it's lovely out at Pinjara Hills out in the eucalypts there with the parrots and stuff. And I sat there and with this big black bull and just watched the buffalo flies all day. No mating. So we thought, oh, look, some mosquitoes, light has an effect. So we said, OK, we've got to do it through the night. We'll, we'll start, start at dusk and, and get back there for dawn again. And sure enough, um, as the sun started to go down, we saw this sort of milling behaviour amongst the flies. Now, buffalo flies, one of the diagnostic points of them is that they don't walk on the, on the surface of cattle. There's another species which does. But buffalo flies fly from place to place. However, they were doing this milling behaviour and then sooner or later we actually saw them mate down in this lower part here um, and, and after walking around and presumably contacting each other. So, so that was it, basically. That was the stuff that was doing it. So, so we needed to, um, to change our, our idea. So what we actually did, this is our, our, our buffalo fly um, colony. We actually put in a nightlight regime, which had a, basically has fluoros during the day. Then we have a neodymium light, which, which has, has a wavelength more like what happens at dusk and dawn. We then give them the infrared, and then they, give, they have the black light. We also put in there something which mimicked the back of cattle. and You can see the flies there. And lo and behold, they started to mate and we've got a colony which we've now maintained for 60 generations and means that we can do all this stuff. So that was, it was a nice little bit of biology, really. The, um, so the, the other question that we needed to answer was, is Wolbachia already present in buffalo flies? Because we didn't know at this stage. And so we, we, we collected buffalo flies from various places around Australia. Um, and, and at that stage, there was a guy, uh, Kevin Float, who's one of the few other livestock entomologists around the place from Lethbridge in, in Canada, was out here. And he'd worked a bit with Wolbachia as well, so he, he was sort of interested in this. So, so we, we got the flies. Uh, Bing Zhang, who some of you will know, did the PCR. We couldn't fly, find any, any Wolbachia in any of the buffalo flies. We sent them to, to Kevin in, in Canada, and he sent horn flies back to us. And, and everything worked. We got, got Wolbachia in buffalo fly. He, didn't get, get Wolbachia in, in um, so we got, we got Wolbachia in hornfly, um, he didn't get Wolbachia in buffalo fly, and we even had one, one buffalo fly from, um, from Bali, from Indonesia, and we didn't find Wolbachia in that at all either. So, so no Wolbachia here, so that, was, that, that makes life a whole lot easier. No, it wouldn't have been a game breaker if it was, but it makes life easier. Um, and it also suggests that the, the, the horn fly, the, 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 endemic, the endemic nature of the horn fly suggests that buffalo would be a, comp, a competent host. Because not all insects are competent hosts for buffalo, for, for Wolbachia. Not, not all at all. So the other thing that we needed, the, 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 the standard way of getting Wolbachia into a new species is to adapt them in cell lines first. So we needed a, um, a, a buffalo fly cell line. We had one. To cut it short, it got wiped out during the floods, and then we just couldn't get it going again. So I went and spent some time in um, the lab, early, early Mundalow and, and Tim Curdy in Minnesota. And, and Tim, Tim and Uli has been had here before to help with tick line tick cell lines in, in, in South Australia, in, um, uh, in the, the old DAF. Um, and under their guidance, we, we, the idea was to take, take buffalo flies over there to do the buffalo fly cell line. But as always happens, the quarantine approval didn't come through soon enough. So we did, did it with horn fly. We've got a cell line going. We've now got those cells out here, not infected with Wolbachia. Um, so we now have, have the cells if we need them. However, um, 
Tim, in the meantime, just played a bit with Wolbachia in the, in the hornfly lines and found out that he could really easily transfect them. With, he put two, two, two um, strains of Wolbachia in there. Now, very accommodating. So we're now actually thinking that we may not even have to do this step. We might be able to directly, if, if, it, if, buff, if, if buffalo fly is, is an equally permissive host, we might be able to just direct directly inject. But anyway, we've got the cell lines and we will, we're certainly going towards going forward now to adapting them um, in, in, in the cell lines. Um, uh, yeah, and so um, the other thing is we didn't bring in any of Tim's transfected cells because our permit didn't allow us to do that. But also we want to do it with Australian strains because if we ever get to the stage of releasing these, um, it just you know, it means we're not releasing anything which is exotic. And there's there's a whole there's some interesting issues around what the release of bark here. Um, so I think I'll, I'll just, just, just finish there. I'm sorry I finished in a bit of a hurry. But basically, we have a range of livestock pests and diseases which are going to increase their range under climate change. Area, and this might provide a particular opportunity for a number of different um, invasive pests. Um, there's a number of advantages to directly targeting the insect populations rather than having to, to deal with the animals. And there's some really exciting technologies out there now, which, which for the first time provide some really interesting possibilities. So our end point would be something like this, a whole lot of dead flies in the cage, or maybe just, just one with its fitness a bit compromised so they're not going to mate and do much in the field. Um, so just finishing there, and just some people I should acknowledge. Jeff Brown, who's been involved in all of this all the way through um, the... Um, uh, the, the, the colony development. Bing did the PCRs and the early cell line stuff. Uh, Tim and Early at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Pia Olison at USDA at Kerrville provided us with the horn fly cells for the, for the, the, um, uh, the culture. Kevin Flight at Ag Canada uh, in, in the, the, um, uh, the, the paper stuff. Paula uh, who, who looked at the, um, the light effects and Jim Rothwell, who was involved in the early stages of this. And I should have put you up there as well. Wayne Wayne was involved as well in the early stages. So I'll finish there. Thanks. They're largely host differences, um, yeah, mainly host differences. So most of the most of the substrains are, are designated by the species they came from. We've we know so we're we're, we're working with um, with I, I mentioned Beth Beth McGraw at, at Monash. So so we've got strains from there, and also doing stuff with Sasan now. Uh, and Sasan's got strains as well. So we're using strains that were isolated in Australia, and that makes life. A lot easier, and we'll probably we'll try the the popcorn one, and and we'll probably W mill pop, and we'll start off with the W out of Albert Pictus. Have you tested those against the uh, fly yet? The, the one from Monash. You said that that's a uh, well back here in Australia, but we haven't got the fly down to Melbourne yet. No, 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 we haven't done anything in buffalo flies. That's, that's where we're getting to. So we've got the, the, um, the reason for the cell lines is, as Arla alluded to, that the, the, they are really quite host specific, the strains, and so you need to adapt them to get them in there. So no one's tried to put, I mean, none of this stuff, there wasn't a horn fly cell line, there wasn't a buffalo fly cell line, there wasn't a buffalo fly colony. So no, no one's even thought about looking at it in buffalo flies. But, but yeah. Mosquitoes. If we were devoid of mosquitoes, this has been talked about a lot. I mean, one of the things where they are important is is in in food chains, and so for example, bird food chains and the larvae in water. Um, so yeah, this is, this has been a, a big talk about the whole yeah you know, because mosquitoes is where lot, most of this work's been done for Wolbachia, for filariasis, for dengue. Oh, sorry, I mean for dengue, for filariasis, for malaria, and so that's been discussed a lot. And, yeah, in food chains, they, they could be important. Buffalo fly is different, though. That's, see, we, we take to go the right boxes here, Steve, because it's invasive. 
And so it's not part of the, the original ecosystem in Australia anyway. And, you know. Well, we think it might eventually, yeah. <laughs> Not, uh, not that I'm aware of. I think they've looked, and I'm really not sure whether it's there or not, to tell you the truth, Jim. Yeah, because of the... Yeah, 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 it would be. I mean, um, it depends which black flies you're, t you're talking about. Livestock, pests... No, 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 no. Well, back here for, for Alcacerca, yeah. Yeah, no, they're not, and I suspect they'd... They'd be a little bit worried that they might be working at competing... Um, edges because you know the way they're using well bark here in Alcacerca at the moment is to wipe it out with antibiotics in 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 the in the in the human host and so they yeah they, I, I doubt that anyone's trying to do it as a, and black flies you, know, you can breed them but they're hard to yeah yeah, yeah. sorry no, we haven't. It's, it's not, I, I'm pretty sure, I'm right in saying it's not, not present in any of the Califorids. Um, it's not in house fly. Uh, so, so that's why it's interesting that it's in buffalo fly. And it, um, it's in, you know, pe the, the numbers of species, insect species, it's in, you know, varies wildly, from, suggested from somewhere between 40 and 60%. But, but yeah, the Cali a number of those fly species are not. And it se nearly seems to be the ones that are, yeah, I was going to say, it nearly seems to be the ones that the vector something, or well, the blood feeders tend to be yeah, more infected. Yeah, there's some that overwinter that have that dieback. Because the bark is not stable in populations and can drop out, you think it's the more hardy ones that have dropped them from the bark here that form the winter group, therefore we uh, use the next generation yeah. expand. Yeah, I, look, I don't know. Kat. I mean, you can. Th that's the thing with Warbaki. You can. There's a million hypotheses you can test. It does different things in different contexts. And you know, if we put it into buffalo fly, we're not quite sure what it will do once it gets there. The, the other thing, just just talking about the specificity of Warbaki. So it's not present in any of the Anopheline mosquitoes. So it's not in Anopheline, and it's not. It wasn't. You know. So so it, it's there's. It is quite. It's not. You know, very Catholic in its in its choices. Yeah, and that's why the whole cell line stuff that we, you know, to get it into horn fly, uh, to get it into buffalo fly, we'll probably need to adapt to the cell lines. Yeah.